We are at Hebrews chapter 10. Um, just uh, one, one uh, sort of start off question from last week. What does it mean to draw near with a true heart? Remember we had that. And, uh, and sort of the follow-up question to that is, where do we hear that line in the liturgy? Which I also asked last week. What does it mean to draw near with a true heart? What do you think of that? Isn't that before the confession? Yeah. Yeah, that's that announcement at the confession. Let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. So, yeah, so that is actually an exact quote from from Hebrews chapter 10 that we get in the liturgy. Those happen actually like quite often. If you've never if you've never looked in the uh, looked at the fine print in the hymnal, you'll find that a lot of times in the liturgy uh, there will be a little scripture verse that will be listed kind of in connection to that, which is uh, which is there. So so that's kind of where we where we use it. Come so to draw near with a true heart. Um, really means just what it says. It means, first of all, to be, uh, to confess means to speak the truth. And so, to draw near with a true heart means to confess, confess your sins, confess yourself as you are, not as you wish you were. And so, we don't have to be afraid to come into God's presence, even, um, even though we are sinners. Why? Because Christ is the one who cleanses us from all sins. Catherine. Is that sometimes said, draw near with a pure heart? Well, because true and pure are not the same. They are not, they are not the same. Um, and, and of course, when, I, when, this, when we came up to this verse last week, several people have mentioned Psalm 51, which has created me a clean heart, O oh God. And, um, Pretty sure that in, that in this instance in the in the Greek it is the word true and not pure or clean, but um, but they do kind of come at it from a different angle. Yeah. Well, this is like almost like quiet your mind. Yeah. Right? Some like uh, right. You still know that I am God. Right. If I'm going to draw you with a true heart, I have to I have to like try to shut things off. Right. And, and be uh, be mindful of, of where I am, who you are, and, and where you are. Yes. Yeah. I'm kind of thinking of the, the Pharisees' prayer. It says, "I thank you, God, that I'm not like that apology for a human over there." Right. Yeah. Right. Right. I thank you that I'm not like other people. And, and there is also a sense a sense here too of uh, that this is a recognition of yourself and not a comparison to others. I agree. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah. I was going to say, to, to kind of piggyback on what Bob was saying, not just that, but also an honest heart. True. Yeah, so right. True means who we are. Right. We're honest. For real. We and confess our sins. So we have the faith to actually what we are. And yep. It's not true. Yep. That's right. That's right. Okay. We're going we're gonna to go on. Thank you, though, to kind of get us back into that. This is, uh, this is where we. Uh, um, where we started, and there was just so much in here that uh, I thought we needed to get at that one more time. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and to good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing. All right, so here we get this, uh, you know, our favorite word word at the beginning. Therefore, I told you that to tell you this. <laughs> uh, this is the this is the point, and and what is his point in this whole this, this whole paragraph 
um, his point is, let us draw near, draw near to what? To God. And where does that drawing near to God take place? We get, we get this, we certainly get this, <coughs> lots of baptismal language here, the sprinkled and washed, and that, that kind of gets, gets also to your cleansed language. And, and, and in fact, we get sprinkled clean. How is it that we are, in, we are able to enter into God's presence because God has cleansed our conscience by his word and spirit? And that's a and that's very um, that's a very interesting idea. Um, I think I mentioned it briefly last week. What is an evil conscience? And then what is and then kind of to flip that the other way? What is a good conscience? What is an evil conscience? What is a good conscience here? Sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. Mm. That is kind of a strange way of thinking. I don't. I don't Does usually an evil think of it. Be not working? <clears throat> yeah. What is an evil conscience? Yeah, not working, maybe, Pastor. It's the condition of not being washed, unforgiven, or being washed and forgiven. Okay. So cleansed or not cleansed. Right. Forgiven, not forgiven. <laughs> so if one has an evil conscience. And I would, I would or argue outside, that outside the yeah, outside, right, outside the covenant. That's pretty good. That's pretty good language too. I think that's helpful. Um, that that uh, to have this evil conscience may take place in one of two ways. <coughs> as, as I kind of kind of think on this, one is to is to utterly reject God's mercy. So, you know, the kind of the, the, the posture of pride to be in, uh, to say, I don't have any sins, essentially. That would be, that would definitely be, uh, be an evil conscience. Is if you refuse to recognize yourself as a, as a sinner in need of God's mercy, what that means is that, uh, is that your conscience is, is is not good. It's not right because you don't you aren't recognizing yourself as you truly are. Okay? Yeah. Rick and then Diane. Well the curious thing is that conscious by almost by definition refers to something inside of you that yep. knows what is right. Yep. The good news translates this as saying purified from guilty. I'd have to look at it to see what to look at it in, in Greek to see what that to see what that word is. I don't have it in front of me, but um, you probably get some That's evil. Yeah, I mean that's the, the word is the word is evil. You know, poneros is the word. So evil, like pornography, is evil writing. Um, so that's, that's that's the word evil. But guilty would at the least be implied behind that. Yeah. Here's the uh, the professor Art Jess. Uh, takes us right to the birth of Christ. Okay. We have two that are dealing with evil conscience. We have those six miles away in Herod's palace. Right. Who will totally reject. Right. And will bring about evil as part of the Christmas narrative. That's right. The slaughter, slaughter of the innocents, etc. You can have those who are outside, who know nothing of it, who continue to live in fear of God, including the shepherds. Right. Until the good news comes and cleanses their conscience to be holy Christian. There you have it. So, and, and that is strangely enough, exactly what I was what I was getting at earlier. <laughs> that 
that you have the one in pride who, who has kind of taken right and wrong and said, I am now the arbiter. I am now the one that can determine what is right and wrong, even to the point where I can murder all of these children in Bethlehem because might makes right, essentially. Okay, so now they become their own sort of measuring stick of what is true and right. That's that's one. And then the other are those that live in either despair or or fear of fear of God. And um, and who maybe recognize their unworthiness in whatever fashion that is, but they don't know how to get back out of it. Okay, so you've got either those who are pridefully, willfully, uh, willfully rejecting it and, and becoming a law to themselves, or you have those that recognize that have been um, that that have been afflicted by the law, have gotten the law, recognize their unworthiness, but have not gotten to, but haven't heard the good news, but haven't heard the gospel, and that's I think Rick. Where, where the Good News translation is getting it guilty there a little bit more. Um, but... Uh, well, that's one of the meanings of, of yeah, the word, but it's, right. it's low on the totem pole. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it really is much more evil than, than, than guilty. Because I mean, they, they're, they're, they're related, but it's not, it's not the same. Diane, I'm sorry, I, I skipped you earlier. Um, what keeps coming to my mind is for if God is true, Yep. So, if you know God, and you study God, you study the law, you study right. God, you know the good news, then you're aware of truth. Yep. But if you don't know God, and you don't read anything about from God or about right. God, then that alone is evil because you aren't we born evil. Sure. We're well, right. I mean, that's our sinful that's our sinful nature. That's kind of what's, what's getting at that. There. Now, and I don't want to go too far afield on the conscience thing, but it is worth mentioning that our consciences are are uh, damaged by the fall, are messed up by the fall, are broken by the fall, um, and and that and so by nature I can't do what is right. I can have some sense that there is a right and wrong. <laughs> Whether I can actually do it is another question. But, um, I, I mean, that's called the natural knowledge of God. This, and this is why you can, you can go into any culture in the world, Christian, unchristian, you know, had, has been exposed to the <laughs> word of God or not, and they're still going to have some, some kind of moral code that's going to be, don't kill each other, don't sleep with your neighbor's wife, don't steal, don't, you know, this stuff we would call the second table of the law. And I would argue that that is, that that's kind of this residual or, or leftover, uh, leftover part that we get from the natural knowledge of God. Now that's not, that's not saving knowledge of God, right? You know, I can, I can have some vague sense of how an airplane works does not mean I can make an airplane. Okay? I can have some, some knowledge of the mechanics of a thing that does not mean that I, that I get it or that I can do it myself. So, so back to kind of what this is getting at is Jesus is the one who cleanses us from that evil or guilty conscience and, and that we are washed with, washed with pure water. Okay, so that kind of gets us up to verse 23. We almost get another therefore at the beginning of 23. <laughs> Let us <coughs> hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. That kind of gets at this We've seen this throughout the book of Hebrews, this concept of endurance or holding steadfast in the face of persecution or difficulty. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promises is faithful. 
and that's a and that's definitely a gospel word there, right? He promises was faithful. So this is a uh, an exhortation to sticking with our confession, with the confession of who we are. Why? Because the one who made the promises to us is good. Is good for it. I'm good for it. That sort of thing. And, and this is where it really gets interesting, at least to me. Let us, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. So now we move from faith to good works. Okay? Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So this really gets us to the therefore of this whole thing. How is it that our hearts are cleansed? How is it that, that God continues to be at work creating faith, sustaining faith, teaching us and giving us the endurance that we need as Christians in the face of trials and difficulties? And how is it that we are stirred up to love and good works? How, or maybe even the better question is where, does that take place? The meeting together, which is what? Church. That's church. That's the divine service. <laughs> and uh, and since uh, Liz is keeping me honest on my Greek here, <laughs> she can look and see. See how I turned that on her? Yeah. She can look and see if I'm right that that meet together is synagogue. Synagogue. To gather together as one, verse 25. There you go. Let's start. So, so this is so here. He is it? Yeah. So, so he's actually using an intentionally Hebrew expression to describe what Christians do in gathering together to receive their Lord. He's saying, don't neglect to synagogue. <laughs> Don't neglect meeting together. Yeah, because he puts the epi before it. So. Yep. Right, the epi synagogue. Don't don't neglect this. Don't give up meeting together. And just as and I would argue that this is that this is as important an exhortation today as it was then, maybe even more so. That the way that God continues this work of cleansing the conscience, of, of creating faith, of stirring up good works, where that takes place is in the gathering together around his word. Where two or three are gathered together, there I am in the midst of them. Now, there was a hand over here in the pastor. Yeah, Suzanne. I'm just curious what church looked like for them at that time? Were they in a building? Were they, did they uh, have a certain that's, that's a good That's a good question. Um, they certainly did not have dedicated buildings. That's for sure. What, what was very much the case for those first couple generations was that in Jerusalem at least, the Christians continued to go to synagogue to the Jewish synagogues. Do you know, do you know what a synagogue is? When I when I use that word, that's probably worth no. backing up for just a second and say, <clears throat> when um, go backwards six hundred years to uh, the exile, when <coughs> the what is left of Israel, Judah and Benjamin and the, whatever Levites were left around are carried off to Babylon. This is called the Babylonian captivity. It takes place around 600 BC, okay? When that takes place, sometime in that neighborhood, the temple, Solomon's temple, is also looted, and the ark disappears. You know, 
know. Now, we, of course, know that it's in a warehouse in Washington, D.C. <laughs> but, but nevertheless, the same argument, um, the art is taken away and, and disappears. And, and they're in exile for 70 years. When they return from exile, the ones that, re that return from exile, they now have a massive kind of crisis of faith. And that is, where's God? <laughs> Where do we worship? <laughs> the temple's been destroyed. The ark is gone. There's no mercy seat. There's no, you know, they're, they're, all of it's gone. It's all gone. And, and at that time, you begin to see develop um, a, where they are gathering around reading and meditating on the word and less on less of a focus on the temple. Now, there is, the temple is rebuilt, uh, you know, we get that in Ezra and Nehemiah, but nevertheless, the, syn the, the synagogue, these, these small gathering places, starts to become more, more prominent, where they, would, where they would gather together, and a rabbi, you know, a rabbi isn't a priest, He's a teacher. I mean, that's what the word means. It's teacher. And so a rabbi comes and teaches the word of God to these, to these people. It's interesting that the, that the office of pastor, as we, as we have kind of received it from the New Testament, is sort of a combination of the priest, although the pastor doesn't make a sacrifice, right? Because the sacrifice has been made. He delivers the... He delivers the benefits of the sacrifice and the rabbi, the teacher of God's word. So, so that's what a synagogue is. And those synagogues could take place anywhere. It required 10 men, uh, Jewish men, to make a synagogue. That was kind of the, the minimum. And so Jesus is, among other things, called rabbi because he is, he is a teacher of God's word. Now I'm going to let Pastor Meyer fill in any blanks that I left out. Well, uh, one of the questions is we talk about synagogue. Who's asked to synagogue? You have to go back to that first 19 and decide whether brothers are right. the first of those of the Portland Seminary who did their acts of Jesus with Indiana Jones. Right. And uh, uh, decide if all brothers to brothers is only Right. Or, or, you know, what is it? I like the way the editorial note in the ESV, you know, reads. Greek Adelphi, a general term Paul used for fellow Christians and co workers in Christ's mission, whether male or female. However, Paul also used the term specifically for a man who led the congregation. So, every time you see that word brothers, you have to stop and listen to the context. Um, is he addressing with the whole congregation, or is he just addressing uh, the, you know, the leaders of the congregation? Here, it is that general. It's everyone. It's everyone. Absolutely. It's male or female. Right. Which is really a stumbling block to the yeah. Jew. Or, um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. It is. Because by grace and in baptism, the Father adopts Christians into the sonship that belongs to Jesus by nature. <clears throat> this makes people unrelated by blood to the siblings to one another. Yeah. Oh, so man. it's just brothers and sisters. Yeah. yeah. And, and so this synagogue <laughs> isn't <laughs> just... Um, this isn't simply men's work. This is, this is the identity of the church as the baptized. So while he uses this, this very Jewish term to describe what they do, this epi synagogue, um, it clearly is not the same <laughs> given, the, given, the, given the context from the rest of the book. So to kind of get back to Suzanne's, Suzanne's point is what, 
what happened in those first couple centuries, couple generations, is you had Christians that would, <coughs> that would go to temple or would go to synagogue, to the Jewish synagogue, but would also have this, uh, have their own gathering for the Lord's Supper, for the Eucharist, which usually took place at night at that, at that time. Um, and that's and, and that I would I would argue is is really specifically what he's talking about here is don't neglect the gathering together of the people of the people of God because this is where God God meets. Remember um, at the end of at the end of Luke where we get Jesus' ascension into heaven. What do they do right afterwards? Anybody remember this is your Bible trivia for Advent 4? <laughs> what did they do right afterwards? Pastor Meyer can't answer. <laughs> they what? They probably had potluck. <laughs> well, they were, they were more pious than us, though. They went to the temple. They went to temple and praised and praising God. And so they continued, they continued that, that practice of, of going to temple. And that's and that is still one of these sort of larger contexts that we get in this whole book of Hebrews is why are we going to temple when Jesus is the sacrifice? And now we get the next question. Why are why aren't we going fishing? <laughs> or doing or doing something else. Why do we gather together at all? Since Jesus did, uh, did all of it. Is everybody with me here? Yeah. And so, and so his answer is that this is where this, this stuff takes place. And that this is also where we are, and we are encouraged to love and good works. And so we are, as the body of Christ, to spur one another on to love and good works as well. Now, there's a couple questions for Marion and Catherine. I thought I saw somebody. Marion. Well, so, the early Christian Jewish people, so much temple, and then they met separately with each other, so that would probably be homes. Yeah, absolutely. So at that time, did they have to meet in secret? I mean, was it dangerous? Um, that was going to vary from kind of time, time, place to place on, on whether they were able, uh, I mean, I don't think that there was ever a point when they were, you know, having the little, uh, uh, you know, having, having a, a sign out that, that says come to, come to church at, you know, 7 p.m. At, at Brother Ruben's house or whatever. But um, but how secret it had to be really depended on the level of hostility with the Jewish leadership and with the Romans at a given time. Good question. Yeah. Yeah. So, am I understanding right that what kind of summing this up is that the Jew, the Christians were recognizing that why are we going to temple when or to to the, to Whatever. Or to synagogue. Synagogue. When that sacrifice is done and made, Jesus did this. Right. We don't really need to be doing that anymore. Let's let the sacrifice is made. Let's just go on living. We don't need right. to go. And Paul is, or whoever the writer is, saying, No, you do still need to go. But if you're not going for God, you're going to encourage one another. Well, I would say you're going to receive. To receive. And to, but, but and the for one is another. You, not yes. Not the concept of we don't need to go to church to in order, serve God. In order to do something God for God. Us. Yes, that's certainly true. Okay. That's certainly true. Barbara, and then Liz. Um, verse 25. Um, the immediacy of it and the uh, I get these thoughts sometimes and they're probably way off the wall. But um, at the end it says the morning to the day drawing near. To me this reminds me of Advent and Lent. Yeah. Uh, encourage one another as we get ready for the day of the birth, or we get ready for the day of the resurrection. Yeah. Even more so, we should we should be meeting together and encourage one another. Yeah. To to receive <coughs> both or right and and the day, the day here certainly refers to the last 
day, but, um, but whether you're talking about the day of Jesus' birth or the day of his sacrifice or the last day, those are those all kind of mush together in some in some senses and how we kind of and how we think about those things, right? Uh, why do we care about about Jesus' birth? We care about Jesus' birth because Jesus' birth leads to Jesus' death and our salvation. Why do we care about Jesus' death and our salvation? Because because then I will be saved not just for today but for all eternity. <laughs> and so they are all intimately connected together. Liz. I was just going to ask you, is this um, kind of his gen the obvious gentle reminding of the commandment? Oh, so definitely. That even though Christ has fully, fulfilled, he's fulfilled, right. he's the fulfillment, we still do need to follow God's so Right. Like, well, and that's, and you know, how to, that's really, I, I, would, I would argue that this is a part of what Luther has in mind when he deals with the third commandment. You can see that in both the small catechism and in the large catechism. We should fear and love God so that we do not despise preaching and his word, but hold it sacred and gladly hear and learn. I mean, there's this, why do we gather together? We gather together for the sake of hearing and learning God's word and for each other. And, uh, and you know, I, I this, is, this is the time of year I'm going to, you know, since we're drawing near the true heart, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna have a confession here for you, okay? And that is that this is the this is uh, one of the times of years when when pastors tend to get uh, tend to get cynical and slightly crabby. I apologize in advance for that. Um, and the, the reason for that is because this is also the time of year when very often uh, we will see people that we will never see during the rest of the year. Right, and um, and I want them here. We need them <laughs> here. They should be here. Um, but uh, but that is difficult because my own self righteousness, you know, coming back to the pride thing, um, uh, kind of gets at. Oh well, I'm glad to see that you're doing your sort of religious duty and you've gone to church, you know, twice this year. Congratulations. Um, but uh, but that's not helpful. <laughs> <laughs> not for me, not for you, uh, not for any of us. Um, but that is a that is a part of the a part of the challenge that you that you see in all of this is how do we kind of how do we understand that and how do we make this an encouragement for one another and not a way of seeing ourselves as better than others. Anyway, that's my own goal. personal practice. So. Shall we move on? <laughs> Remarkably similar. Right. It's still there. Right. Hold it out 
Bible said about the early Christians Christianized it, and we inherited it. So. The, 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 the historic liturgy and the traditional liturgy probably inherits a lot more from the Jewish synagogue service than it does from the temple service. Um, there are a lot of a lot of the pieces, particularly um, the Sanctus, Holy, 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 that was a that was a synagogue canticle. I mean, so that had been sung for long before um, long long before it sort of got tied into the divine service, into the Christian service. So yeah, we have we, we inherit a lot more from the synagogue worship than we do from temple worship. Yeah, and then as well as the salutation that the Lord be with you and with your spirit, lift up your hearts, we lift them up to the Lord. I mean, that's the same, same kind of language. Yeah, John. Christians who went to the temple, they more than likely did not participate in any temple sacrifices. That's a good question. If they did, would that not be so happy to face? Well, and, and that definitely is the is is the sense behind what you get in the book of Hebrews is I I I have to think about that. It's a really good question, John. Um, I don't believe that there is textual evidence that would say once Jesus ascended into heaven, they you know completely cut off their temple their temple obligations, okay? I, I, you don't see that in the, in the scriptures. What you do see is lots and lots and lots of language about this not being necessary or this being obsolete. I mean, we, got, we get that in Hebrews as well. And so, and, and so there is this, this transition period where they're kind of asking, why are we doing this? <laughs> and and so that eventually it 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 simply disappears sort of of its own accord. Well, we have answered the question by raising another question. Do all confessional Christians today practice proper communion? Right. Uh, I mean, we could and we could ask that on lots of lots of things. Right. right. Hebrews was written because the practice was muddled. Right. Because they're because they're in this in this sort of middle period where it's no longer necessary. And if you today were to go and say, we have to reinstitute the sacrificial system, and we have to go to the warehouse in Washington, DC and find the ark and you know and, and kind of do all of this stuff. Today, if you were to do that, that would be an affront to the gospel. Because that would be saying Jesus' sacrifice isn't enough, right? Um, at that point, they were in the process of fully understanding the depth of Jesus, of Jesus' work. That's how I describe it. That's a, it is a really good question, though. All right. Yes, please. I was going to ask, because how Paul writes in his epistles as well, they weren't celebrating the feast at synagogue or at temple. They were doing it afterwards right. together. And is that also part of that verse, like encouraging people to meet together? Don't right. just go off. Right. And Don't just do your own this thing. Is where we will have. Right. This. Don't just do your own thing, but continue to gather together. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I know we're not going to get very far in this, but just so that I can feel like we've got more than one slide done, I'm going to read a little bit here. <laughs> All yeah, it's all about it. Thank you. <laughs> or if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversary. Anyone who set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved? by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the Spirit of grace. For you know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, and again the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Oh, that's a great place to have it. <laughs> 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 
Yeah. Well, just to uh, just to get this to start this conversation a little a little bit, the uh, the operative word there, or probably the big the, the big word there is the word deliberately. And that and 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 so, so you get deliberately and go on sinning. What this is describing is what happens if one know you know the truth, learn the truth, hear it, perceive it, have received the gospel, it's it's right there, and not only do you reject it, you knowingly, willfully, intentionally, and continually reject it. So this is that's what this is describing. And you definitely get the sense that this is that this is in the context of, of this Jewish Christian community that is struggling with precisely this question that John brings up. And that is, at what point do I come to know the truth and just say, I refuse to receive it? At what point is that what's going on? And, th and that's why I would argue that there's that there's all of this go on or continually continually that's not even a word it's time to quit that I think continuing to uh, to sin intentionally to say I know this is a sin and I'm going to do it and I'm going to keep on doing it I don't care what anybody thinks so that's so that's kind of the start on this but we'll pick this up after Christmas <laughs> and then go on. Um, I did have one uh, one announcement that I that I forgot to uh, forgot to mention at the beginning, and and that is that we have a reception of new members here uh, this morning. Uh, we received Dorothy Lemons at the at the first service. Welcome, Dorothy. And we will be receiving the Nunning family at the second service as well. So welcome, Nunning. Um, there are a couple other people that I, that we are in the process of receiving, but I don't think that they're able to be here today. That's Christian Weber and Mike Kralinski. So we'll uh, we will uh, we will deal with them later. <laughs> they weren't able to be here. Let's close up the benediction. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. <laughs>